I just started the recording and I'll share my screen. But if you were here or you went out to the YouTube site and you looked at the pseudocode, was that helpful while you were doing the labs? So if you could throw that into the chat if you have an opportunity, I'd appreciate it. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So, whoops, don't want to do that. So tonight we are talking about loops. Last week, we, here we go, loops general. So last week we talked about making a decision. An if statement, an else, elif, how do you get, how do you ask a question to the computer in a way in which it can give you an answer that it understands? And we, we kind of learned a little bit about how to communicate with it. We learned about Boolean operators. We learned about Boolean expressions. And this is the next step. Looping is the next step. All of those things that have applied, that applied with if statements, the concept of a Boolean expression, absolutely applies to a loop. What a loop adds is the ability to reuse your code. And that's huge. Okay, so far everything we've written, the line will ever, a line of code will only ever be executed at most once. Last week we found ways to skip code. If it doesn't, you know, if, you know, there, it doesn't, the Boolean expression doesn't evaluate to true, then the code in the block won't work. So this week, we're going to learn how to use the same code repeatedly. And from this point on, you'll hear me harp some about reusability. And that's because it's really a key principle in programming. Every line of code costs someone something. Okay? I get paid when I write code, so my employer has to pay me. Um, most Professional programmers get paid by an employer or they own their own business. So that line of code that's being written costs something. And so it's important to be able to reuse the code as much as possible. So if we create code that is data independent and is driven by the input that that, that, that code gets, and it can be used again and again and again, we reduce the cost of what it takes to create the code. We also can reduce the cost of what it takes to maintain the code. Because the cost of code isn't just the fact that I wrote a line of code. It's that six months down the road, I'm going to have to change that. Maybe the requirements have changed. Maybe I didn't write it right and I created a bug. Whatever the reasons are, that, that there's an initial cost and there's the ongoing cost. So reusability allows us to help manage cost. And it's a very, very important concept that a lot of new students don't really get introduced to. We don't talk about this in Zybooks. You don't necessarily talk about this in most programming classes. But the reason that you want to do loops and you want to do functions is so that you can create code that is data driven and reusable. Well, how important is that um, for what we're doing in this class? Well, it's kind of important because your final project has to be data driven and the code has to be reusable. And so this week we're going to start talking about some of those things associated with your final project. So, what's a loop? A loop is the ability to iterate through some criteria and run the same set of code again and again and again. That's what a loop is. Um, there are two kinds of loops. There's a while loop and there's a for loop and we're going to do both of those this week. There is the main loop expression, 
which is a Boolean expression, just like an if statement was. So if it evaluates to true, you execute the code in the loop. If it doesn't, it skips it. Exact same principle. And so they will talk about the body of the loop, which is the code inside the loop after the loop statement. And we'll talk about an iteration. And an iteration is one pass through the body of the loop. And I'll demonstrate all this in PyCharm so that it, it hopefully becomes really clear. Um, so I'm going to go right into while loops. There are two types of loops. There's a while loop and there's a for loop. A while loop basically allows you, it's just like a for loop, to repeat the code based on an expression. And there are two types of while loops. There's one with a counter and one with a sentinel. The one with a sentinel you're going to have to get really familiar with because your project has to have a while loop with a sentinel. But the syntax is very, um, it, it's very straightforward. While is a keyword, okay? Nothing else can be called while in your program. It's a reserved word for Python, and it specifically tells Python, when you see the word while, get ready because a loop is coming. So while, and then after the while, there is an expression, just like after the word if, there was an expression. You know, my input is less than 10, whatever it is. And then we have our friendly neighborhood colon here. Always remember your colon. And then once, assuming this expression is true, then you're going to do stuff that are inside the body of the loop. And you're going to hear me talk about inside the body of the loop and outside the body of the loop. Like, I, you, like last week I was talking about inside the if block and outside the if block. It's exactly the same thing. So that's what the syntax of a while loop looks like. Um, and so the, I, I, like I said, there are two types of while loop. There's a while loop with a counter and a while loop with a sentinel value. And a sentinel value is just a way of saying um, if something changes in the loop and this specific value isn't that value anymore, then break out of the loop. Because that's one thing you can do in a loop that can drive people crazy is you can actually create a loop that will never stop if you don't program it right. Or maybe you do. Maybe you want a loop that don't, doesn't stop. I tend to not want loops. I like to have loops that I can stop. And the sentinel value gives you an opportunity to break out of a loop, to stop the execution of a loop. And the example we have here is we have this user value. Now you'll notice that when, when they're talking about user value, user value is the sentinel here. And I know it's the sentinel because it's in my while statement. And then, you know, they set it equal to a dash. And the real important thing here is that they, they didn't set it to the value that will cause the loop to stop. Because the value because what this while loop says is until user value is Q. So this reads while user value is not the same as Q, then do something. Then do this stuff. So this a sentinel value allows you to, allows the user to input a value and then be evaluated at, at the next time it iterates up to the loop to see whether or not the, you should even go in the loop. And we'll do that um, in PyCharm in just a moment. But that's what a sentinel value is. Okay, it's a way, if, let's say I was, I was doing a text-based game and I was done with it and I wanted to quit. It would be really frustrating if I couldn't just say quit the equivalent in a GUI is somebody being able to hit the quit button or hit that little X up at the top of your screen. Um, 
So I want to be able to stop it. I want to be in control of how it stops. So that's what a sentinel value gives me. So let's go and look at PyCharm for a second. And by the way, I'll put all this code up on um, on uh, the YouTube site. Okay, so this is, let me make it bigger. So this is just a really simple program. I have a utility variable, a sentinel variable called answer. Now, answer has to be defined outside the loop because um, otherwise the while won't know what it is. So and I'll show you what happens if answer is not defined in a moment. Here, I'm just, what is the answer? And then it prints out the answer. And what will happen is I will keep doing this until I enter a single lowercase q. So let's do this. I'm going to debug this. Let me just get this selected real, real quick. That's not what I want. Uh, hold on. Had it in the wrong place. Oh, nope. Uh, while with Sentinel. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to debug this, and we will walk through this and see what happens. So I've stopped. I know I'm stopped because PyCharm has the nice blue line. I'm in the debugger down here. I've got the console here. So if I step over this line of code, you'll see answer is Y. Now, I am now at the while loop. And the while loop says while the variable the value of the variable answer is not a single lowercase q do what's in this loop so answer is y so it's not q so i'm going to step over and now line 6 is about to be executed so i'm inside the loop and i'm giving the user the opportunity to tell me whether they want me to continue that's why you have to have this, if you have a sentinel value, you have to have an input statement inside the loop that sets that sentinel value, that sentinel variable. So I'm setting answer here, and I'm setting it to something. So I'm going to step over that. The console is what is the answer. I'm going to say it's 42. And the answer is now 42. I'm going to print the answer. Now, I'm going back up to line 5. Why did it do that? It did it because while is a keyword that Python knows. It says, okay, just keep repeating and repeating and repeating until the expression evaluates to false. Well, is the expression going to evaluate to false? Answer right now is 42. 42 is not the same as the lowercase q. So guess what? I'm going to go in and I'm going to, oops, somebody have a question? No. Okay, Casey. Could you expand on that? I, it was, that was that the question of whether or not you found the, um, the, yeah, sorry, the pseudocode helpful? Okay. Let me know in the chat. Um, sorry about the break. So 42 is not Q. So now I'm giving myself the opportunity to change the answer again. So I'm, what's the answer? Well, let's say I'm going to say it's 19. Or let's just say it's A. So it's going to print it out. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. The while statement is the top of the loop. A is not the same as Q. I'm now inside the loop. I'm going to ask the question again, and I'm done. I just, I don't want to play this game anymore. I hit a lowercase Q, enter key. I now print 7 because it's inside the loop. 
Now I'm up at the top of the loop again, and I've just done two iterations in the loop. Lowercase q is the same as lowercase q, and then I will go to line 9. And you'll notice I did not go to line 9 until now, because 9 it was outside the loop, and 6 and 7 were inside the loop. And then the game, and then I'm done. So, oh, okay. Okay, not equal. Oh, that's cool. Um, not equal just means it's not the same as. So we have Boolean operators. Let me go. I actually think I had this site up. Okay, Python operators. Um, W3Schools is, is really good. So this is all the operators, and one of those operators, the Boolean operators, is a not equal. So basically, the exclamation point with an equal sign is read as not equal. So the thing on the left-hand side is, is it the same as the thing on the right-hand side? Every expression has a left-hand side and a right-hand side. If we're looking at line 5, right here, the expression has a variable answer on the left-hand side, and I call it the left-hand side because it's on the left-hand side of this Boolean operator, okay? And then I have the lowercase q on the right-hand side. So you're always comparing the left-hand side to the right-hand side when you're dealing with Boolean expressions. Now, equal does not mean assignment here. If it is used in an if statement, if it's used in a while statement, then the, um, the equal, the not equal, or the double equal is a Boolean, a Boolean operator, um, and you are comparing. So we're comparing answer, whatever answer is, to the value, the, a lowercase q. So that's what the not equal is. The not equal basically says anything that is not Q means that you evaluate to true. The only way, I'm sorry, means that you evaluate to true. So A is not equal Q. That's true. 42 is not equal Q. That's true. When it's Q, if when answer was Q, then this evaluated to false because Q is in fact same as Q. It's not, not equal. So let me know if you need a bit more of an explanation or if that is what was necessary. Um, okay, back to here. So that is what a sentinel value is. It allows the user control of when to stop the loop. Well, what if I don't want the user to have control? And we've already stepped through. Well, there's another form of a while loop, okay? And, what, did I just go past it? There is a counter in a while loop. Um, a counter basically allows you to just do that. It counts. So I know that for some number of times, I want this loop to continue. So here... We just have a simple counter, okay? I've made, you know, n is 10. And I've got this value here, counter, and it's a very important again. Counter is what we call a utility variable, and it is always defined outside of the loop you're going to use it. Oh, I promise to show you what happens if that's not, or if the sentinel isn't. If I uncomment that, and I'm going to, this is while with counter. Uh, while count. Okay. So if I run this code right now, I'm going to get an error. And the error is that counter is not defined, but it's right there. It's sitting there at the left hand side for the expression in the while loop. It still isn't, hasn't been defined because there has been no assignment. This is simply a Boolean operator. We're not setting any value into that variable. 
The only way to create the variable in Python is to set a value into it, is to give that variable a value. So that's why we just got that error message. Now, if I run this again, you'll see I won't get that error message. And I didn't get the error message because counter on 6 had been defined already on 4. So if you start to have issues with the fact that it's telling you your variable isn't defined, it's probably not defined or defined in the wrong place. So if I am, I'm just going to run through this in the debugger. So we looked at one with a sentinel. Now we're going to look at one with a counter. So I have some number n set to 10. And I have my utility variable counter, and I've set it equal to 0. Why did I set it equal to 0? I set it equal to 0 because I want to make sure I go into the while loop. If I had set it equal to 11, line 6 would evaluate to false, and I would never make it to line 7. And I want to make it to line 7. So n is just whatever the number is. It could have been 100. Uh, it could have been something that a user input, which is what the challenges will do. So I'm going to say, is counter less than or equal to 10? Well, counter is 0, so yes, counter is less than or equal to 10. So I know that's going to evaluate to true. I'm now going to go to line 7. I'm going to print it. Now, line 8 is very important. I have to change counter. The way I change counter is I increment it. So I'm going to add some variable to counter so that it changes the value. Because if not, if counter stays 0, it's always going to be less than or equal to n, and this while loop is never going to end. So counter gets changed to 1. I go back in the loop 2. As long as counter is less than 10, then I will keep going through this loop and then the minute, so 9 is less than 10, and now it's less than or equal to, which means it will still be true for 10. Now counter is 11, and guess what? I'm going to stop. It's not going to go to line 7. Instead, it's going to go to line 10, because that's outside the loop. And you'll notice here that the indentation rules that you had to use last week for if statements abs absolutely apply here. You have to do the indentation correct. If not, you're going to get those wacky indentation errors. Uh, okay. So do you mean the debugging, Michael? If you do, let me know and I'll show you because we'll go we're gonna okay. We're gonna go through debugging a lot, but basically um, in PyCharm you've got these two you gotta run and you gotta debug. Okay, running just does that. It just runs the program. This little thing that looks like a bug is a debugger. This red dot is the breakpoint. So it tells PyCharm when I'm debugging it, not when I'm running it, but when I'm debugging it, that you want it to stop there. And then you can continue on. So if I hit the debugger, you'll notice there is a, dark, uh, a blue line on line 6. That blue line is the current line that Python is just about to execute, but hasn't yet because I've told it to stop before it does that. That's what the red dot does. You can have as many red dots as you want. So what I want to do is I want to see what happens when this evaluates. So there are these controls down here. We have step over. We have step into. You don't have to worry about that right now, but we'll play with that when we do functions. You have step step into my code. I don't know why they have that. And step out. I use step over a lot. So step over says execute the line of code I'm on and move to the next one. Whatever the next one is. The next one may not be 7. It may be 10, depending on what that evaluates to. So I step over. And because it executed, and you'll know that PyCharm does all this wonderful stuff, then um, I'm going to say now, okay, execute line 7. 
execute line eight, it's going to go back up to line six, and then we're just going to keep going. And when I, if I want to stop, I can just hit the little red button. It is very nice, Casey. I use debuggers in my professional life all the time. I'm not a perfect programmer. I don't know anyone who is. For me, I write the code, I evaluate the code, and then I always test it. And I oftentimes will just run it through a debugger just to make sure that in my head I, I really do know what I'm doing. Not everybody's like that. Not all programmers are like that, and it's okay. Here's a bunch of while examples. These are all really great while examples. You can go through them. They can be very, very help, helpful when, it, when you're really trying to understand while loops. That said, I use for loops way more than I ever use while loops. So this is what we just did. We just did counting with a while loop. This is counting with a while loop. So instead of having a sentinel value, you have the counter. All of that said, I use for loops way more in my daily coding than I do for while loops. Because for loops are meant to count. They're meant to go through a series. So you can, you can just say, you know, in a list, you know, in this range of numbers, there are all kinds of really neat things that for loops can do. A for loop cannot have a sentinel value. So if you have to have a sentinel value, you're going to use a while loop, which means the main control loop in your program that you're going to, you know, submit at week seven, the main control loop is a while loop. So, and you're going to hear me say that a lot because it's one of those things when you start to get all this stuff in your head, it can be difficult for students to, to understand what they need. So I just repeat myself a lot. So, what is my syntax for a for loop? Well, the word for is a keyword in Python. It tells Python that it's about to count things repeatedly. I have some variable. That variable does not have to be defined outside of the for loop, like, you know, that count was before we did the while with the count in it. You don't have to do that in a for loop. Python does that for you. In is another keyword. And that basically is um, the variable, whatever it is, is in whatever the counting that I'm about to do. Because for loops are all about counting. Whether they're counting numbers, whether they're counting places in lists, wh whatever it is, for loops are about counting. So. For variable in container. So the variable could have any kind of value in it, and the container could be a string. You could be going through the characters in a string. You could be going from 0 to 10. And there's a very quick way to do that. So that's what the syntax of a for loop is. And they're not telling you, you know, what variable is and what container is now, because they can be lots of different things. Um, and, and it's very, very handy to do that in Python. So let's go out. Okay. Okay. Can we go over the dice exercise before we leave? Trying to put in the step two, adding the while loop to get the user input. Um, sure. Can you tell me what act, what the, like which challenge the dice exercise is? And we'll try and get to that. All right, so which one was that? Okay. Um, so in the example here, they're doing a list. For name in, and this is just a list, and then they're going to print the name. And that's great because when you go over lists, you're going to need to do that. There's also things for, uh, sorry. 410 or 411 in the additional practice. Okay, we'll get to that probably at the end. So you can loop over all kinds of things. You can loop over a dictionary. You can uh, loop over a word, the, the, sorry, the, the letters in a word. 
um, you can loop over just about anything. So let me go back here and I'm going to do uh, it's my nested for four with range. Okay, so I said that um, for loops are about counting something. And when we had the while loop with the counter, you had to you have to define counter outside, and then you have to add it. And if you don't add it, that while loop's just going to run forever because the counter won't change. So there's a little additional work that we have to do as programmers if you're going to count with a while loop. That goes away if you're going to count with a for loop. Notice I'm doing something very similar, but I have two lines of code. That's it. That's all I need. I have the for keyword. I have the variable counter. You'll notice I have not had to define that outside above that for statement. Python is going to do it for me. I have the in keyword. And here I have this function called range. Range basically says starting at this point and ending at one before so. So zero is the start, six is the end, but you don't actually include the number six. Um, and, and then do something. And in this case, I'm just going to print counter. So I, with two lines of code, let me change this real quick, four with range, with two lines of code, I can do what I need to do. And we'll see here, zero, one, two, three, four, five. And by the way, you have to remember that with range. It doesn't actually include the six. It's saying start from here and count up six. So if you're starting at zero, you're going to end at five because zero to five is six elements. It's the same as when you when we first introduced lists and we first introduce an index for uh, the array for a string. So that's one of the things I wanted to contrast. A for loop is a much tighter concept in Python, and it is extremely useful. Um, and I use it more than I do while loops. Um, that's just printing a list. Counting with range, and I just introduced it. So this is all the things you can do with this range. Range is a function. It's a function like print. It's a function like input. It's a function that is provided by Python to do a specific thing. And the specific thing that you're going to do is you're going to create basically a lower bound and an upper bound and tell Python to increment from the lower bound to the upper bound. And sometimes you can say from the lower bound to the upper bound and then increment two instead of one. Let's say you want to do every other one. So that's what range does. Um, and you could, you don't have to have a range. You could create your own static range. But range is what it, it, it's there to make your life easier. It's there to make it so that you're actually writing less code. And um, so, yes, just get used to range. It's, it's extremely handy. And when you do a challenge that tells you to do every other one, they're talking about changing the final variable because you can... Range can be called multiple ways. Yes. <laughs> I don't wish we could do math, Casey. I'm not great at math. Um, so for range, you can call it in three different ways. You can call it with a single value. In the example, it's five. And what that will basically do is it starts at zero and it counts up five. So it'll end with the value four. The exact same thing is this. So this entry and that entry are identical. I tend to use this syntax because in my brain it's just like always tell it where to start, always tell it where to end. 
Um, again, this is very similar, except instead of starting at 0, we're starting at 3 and we're ending at 7. Here we're starting at 10 and ending at 13. Here is where it gets a little different. The interesting thing is this and these two are the same. This is different because what it's doing is it's saying do every second integer from 0 to 4. So it'll start at 0, it'll do 1, and it'll do 3. Because, I'm sorry, it'll do 0, it'll do 2, and it'll do 4 because apparently I can't do math. Um, so it will do every other one starting at 0 or starting at wherever you tell it to start. Here is how you go backwards. Okay, we're going to start at the higher number. In this case, we're going to start at 5. And we're going to go to 0. And I know that we're going to go backwards because this is a negative number. Um, and the same thing here. If I want to do every second one, I can just do minus 2. So this is going forwards. This is going backwards. So when you have to do the challenge about counting backwards, this is what you want to use. While versus for loops. I think I already did that. Basically, if you're going to count anything, you use a for loop. If you're going to ha need a sentinel value or a way for a user to explicitly break out of a loop, you use a while loop. Okay, nested loops. Just like we could nest if statements last week, we can nest loops now. So a nested loop is just a loop inside of a loop. That's all it really is. And you can do what you need to, um, like O comma val, something like that, yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm going to go back on track. So you can nest loops. So which one are they doing here first? They do nested while. So we'll bring up the nested while example. Nested while is just that. So we have... A, again, a, we, we have the value that we're going to change. We have our sentinel value. And then we have a loop inside of a loop. Now, the important thing here is every time you have another loop, you're going to probably have to have another sentinel value. So I have outer helper as my on line two, which is my sentinel value for the outer loop. And then I have inner helper, which is the sentinel value for the inner loop. And then I'm just going to keep going until, in this case, I'm counting while it is less than or equal to 3. So let's step through this really quick. Okay. Uh, this is nested while. Okay, I'll go, we'll just, I don't know that I feel comfortable going to paste bin since I've never used it, so we'll just go and take a look at the end and see what it is we need to cover. Okay, so I am about to debug this. We're just going to run through this. So I have my outer helper is 0, so I know 0 is less than or equal to 3. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to step over, and I'm now defining inner helper. So inner helper is now defined. I can see it down here. I'm going to print outer helper and inner helper, 0 and 0. I'm going to increment inner helper. And you'll notice that I didn't go all the way back to line 4 to the outer while loop. I went back to line 6 because the inner while loop is always going to finish or break before the outer one gets iterated to next. So I'm going to go through the inner one a lot, and then I'm going to go to the outer one and reevaluate. So here I'm going to print 0, 1. You'll notice my outer helper value hasn't changed because I've not hit line 9 yet. So now I'm going up to line 6 again. Again, I'm not going to line 4. I'm going to line 6. And it's going to say, is 2 less than 3? Yes, 2 is less than 3. 
So now I'm going to print it. I'm going to increment enter, inner helper. Notice outer helper is still zero. At this point, my inner helper is three, which is not less than three. So I'm going to break out of this loop. I'm going to make it to line nine finally. So now I'm incrementing outer helper, and I'm going to go all the way up to the top of that outer while loop. It's going to say outer helper is one. One is less than three. So inner helper is set back to zero. We're starting all over again on the inner one. And then since zero is less than three, I'm going to print one. But because outer is one and inner is zero, and I'm going to go back to the inner loop, and we're going to keep going. And then when I'm going to increment outer, so that's two, and again, I'm just iterating over the inner loop, and then I go to outer loop, three is not less than three, and I'm done. It's a very important concept to understand with nested loops, that you're going to loop, once you get to the inner loop, you're going to loop through that until it breaks, and then and only after the point at which that inner loop stops will you then start to execute whatever was in the outer loop. So that is a nested uh, while. And let's go and do a nested for really quick. So a nested for loop looks very much, very similar. We're just going to have the user input some value, and then I have a variable called outer. I don't have to define it outside, above the four, because Python does that for me. And I'm going to go in range zero to val. And I'm going to print the outer, and then for inner, I'm going to go to zero to val, and then I'm going to uh, just print those. So let's just run this. We'll debug it, actually rather than just run it. Okay, nested four. So I'm just going to debug it. And I'm going to say my number is three, because it's a nice small number. So now I'm going outer in range zero to three, because that's what val is. Val is three. So you'll see that I'm going to enter. And it's going to be 0 to 3. And then I'm just going to print inner with, a, with just nothing. So you'll see I print 1, 2, 3. Now I'm going to the outer loop. And Python is going to increment this for me. So outer is 1. I didn't have to do anything. Python did that for me. I'm printing 1. And then I'm again printing um, for the inner loop and then the outer loop. So that is just an example of a nested for loop. So. How do you set the red dot? Okay, the red dot is set by just, see this band over here? You just click by whatever line you want it to stop. So to set it, you click, and then to get rid of it, you click. That's what you do. That's all you have to do. Yes, that's what you do. So, let's see, where are we? Um, I wanted to take some time to, okay, baby steps, developing a program in incrementally. We are now starting to get into some much more complex concepts than we have for the first three weeks. So it becomes important to understand how to program. Writing a large program all at once, for me anyway, leads to disaster. I, I, I will lose something. I will lose my train. I will not be right. 
So what they're, they're talking about incremental developing, I also call it baby steps. You do one thing and test it. And then you add something to it and test it. So when you're writing your program for you know your final project, don't write the whole thing at once. Start with the fentanyl value. Start with, okay, how do I take in a value from a user? We know we have the input statement. How do I take in an, that value and do something with it that, that means something? And how do I get it so that if I'm running it, I can quit? I can stop. So you're not writing the entire innards of that loop. You're writing a small amount for that loop. And then you're going to add a little something. And my suggestion as well is when you are working on your code, keep copies. If something's working particularly well, copy the file. And, and give it a revision number or whatever, or put a note. Copy it to a different name, copy it to a different directory, and keep it. Because if it's late at night and you're working on the code and you mess something up and you're tired and frustrated, it's going to be really hard to undo what you did. So take basically snapshots of your code early and often because it's much easier to go back and look at what you had done than try and undo what you just did. So incremental programming is important, and it will help save you a lot of frustration. So break and continue. We've, we've just been running through these co this code, and that's great. What if I find a condition where I want to just stop? This is not right anymore. That's where we use the break statement. So the break statement can be used in conjunction with an if to stop the execution of the loop that you're in immediately. That's what a break does. Break literally puts the brakes on a loop. So it's the keyword break. That's all you have to use. It should be inside of an if statement. And um, the concept here, and what's important in this example, is I have nested four loops. This break statement only deals with the loop that it's directly in. So this break statement is in this for loop. If meal costs equal user is, is equivalent to user money break, that will only break out of this inner for loop. It will not do anything to the outer for loop. So I have to actually have that, that expression a second time if I also want it to break out of the outer for loop. So break is a way literally to put on the brakes. It's a way to stop the execution of a loop. But if you have multiple nested loops, you've got to make sure that you're breaking out of everything because it only, it only deals with the loop that you are currently executing. Continue just means I decided I wanted to skip something. So this is what a continue looks like. The keyword is continue. Um, again, it is used inside of an if statement. And what it says is, okay, ignore everything else in the rest of this loop and go back up to the top. So for this case, if I hit this continue, I would go back up to that loop. Because again, the same rules apply about as break as continue. Continue will only continue to the loop for which it is in. So it will not continue to an outer a, a loop that is um, outside. So we have, sorry, we have our outer loop and our inner loop. This if statement is part of the block for this inner loop, so it will only continue up to here. It won't ever go back out to the top loop. Oh, excuse me. Loop else. I don't use loop else. I really don't. You can. This is very valid syntax. You, it, you can treat it almost like an if statement. 
loop through all of this, and if, and if the loop expression evaluates to false, then do something else. The same with the for loop. You can have a for loop, and then you have an else that's related to that for loop that says, okay, when for no longer, when the for loop no longer evaluates to true, do this. Excuse me. Sorry, I was up till 3 a.m. programming. Because that's the life sometimes when uh, you have big deadlines looming. All right. Getting both index and value when looping. Okay. So there's something called the enumerate function. And in basically it allows you to get um, the, the range. Sorry. Um, you want to get the current position of where you're at. And enumerate can allow you to do that. Again, it's not something that I use. I don't really use enumerate that much. Um, if I'm doing something with values and indexes, it's usually because I'm in a dictionary and I will treat that differently than this. Um, so you can use the enumerate function because it'll get you both the index and the element. So if I was using the enumerate function and I wanted to get the index and the element for the second element, I would use the enumerate function, and it would give me the index and the value. So enumerate basically returns two things. Um, so this is the dice statistics. We're going to go and look at the dice, but I want to go over. Um, I want to go over the pseudocode first for the labs. Okay, so we have four labs. We have 4.14, 1.5, 1.6, 1.6, 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 
the character, so word of character counter, so it's just like the stuff we did in the string, is equal to I, then password is going to be exclamation point. So we have all of these if-else statements with an else that basically is password equal password plus word care. So if you don't hit any of these, then what's going to happen is you're just going to put the character in there. And then you're going to increment the counter. Always remember to increment the counter. And then when you're done, you're going to say password equal password plus Q star S because that's what it tells you to do. And then you're going to output password. Now, there's a couple things to, um, to think about here. First of all, we're giving you the sections. Or I'm giving you the sections. But you have to be careful with the indentation. You're going to be indenting completely to the left with the while loop indenting one for the if, and then another one when you're actually going to set the password. So be very careful of your indents here. Okay, 5.16 is, um, oh yeah, we get to, you get to draw a triangle. So 5.16 is drawing the triangle. And what we're going to do is we're going to input a number, a, a character, whatever a character is going to be, and then a height. And then what we want to do is we're going to use nested while loops to create that triangle. So we have to have our extra variable counter. I'm just going to output um, an empty space. And it's while counter is less than height. So, okay. So that would give me a row uh, for each of, well, it would give me the number of rows, but then how do you get the width? So I now I'm going to have a second while loop. So I'm going to have this other sentinel value, which is inner counter, um, and this is inside the first while. So again, indentation is key here. And then I'm going to say while inner counter is less than or equal to counter, output the character, and then I'm going to make sure that I increment for the inner one. I'm going to output a space, I'm going to increment the counter, and then I'm going to go up again. Now you'll notice that this is counter here, it is not height, because I am keying off of where the, what row I am in that triangle. So if counter is zero, inner counter is less than or equal to zero, so I'm only going to end up printing one. Um, that's what the key of this is, is how to use that outer while loop and that inner while loop to control the width of the triangle. Getting the height is easy, getting the width is a little diff difficult. If you get frustrated or have problems with this, go back and check your indentation. That's why I have these little things here. Inside the while loop, inside the second while loop requires two indents. So this is left justified. The set inner counter is indented one. This second while is indented one. And everything inside the second while is indented two. So let's do 7.17. Uh, okay, let's go back and look at that. Ah, everybody has fun with the Mad Live loops. Okay, so basically what you're going to do is you're going to put in three different values. You're going to put in apples five, shoes two, quit two, and then you're basically just going to drop that into a sentence. That's all you're doing. So what we have is we have a word and we have some tokens, okay? And, and it says while tokens is zero because we're going to split the tokens. So they're going to be, uh, they're going to be uh, space separated. Yeah, comma separated, space separated. And we're going to split them into an array. And we learned how to do splitting when we talked about strings. So, so while token of zero is not equal to quit, Output eating token zero, token one space token zero day keeps the doctor away. 
And then I'm going to re-input everything. I'm going to have I'm going to have the ability to control what's happening in the loop while I'm inside the loop. So I'm going to now set the word and I'm going to set the tokens. Now if token of zero is quit, it's going to stop the loop. So this is what you have to do. And it seems that the problem seems, um, well, let me say that sometimes this problem can be tricky for students because of the fact that you're controlling the loop from inside the loop and you've got this tokens of zero is equal to quit. So they don't know that you're actually going to have to put quit as the first element um, when you uh, of the tokens when you want to stop. So that is 4.17 and I'll be putting the pseudocode up along with the other stuff. So let's go back and look at the dice. Honestly haven't looked at that dice one much but we'll give it a try. It is 10 o'clock so my brain may be not quite there. So Following a sample programming lag, not all classes usually require students. To, okay. Um, analyzing dice rolls is a common example in understanding the probability and statistics. Following program calculates the number of times the sum of two dice randomly rolled is equal to six or seven. Create a different version of the program that calculates the number of times the sum of the random rolled dice equals each possible value from 0 to 12. Repeatedly ask the user. Okay, I'm not going to have time to do all of this tonight, Casey. Sorry. This is not a simple one. Um, so, and I don't have an answer. I don't have a ready answer for it tonight. Yeah, this is, this is a multi-step one. It's not a quick and easy. Oh, you got it? Good. You can't get the while loop to stop. Okay. Um, then the while loop is probably not stopping because somewhere along the line you're not incrementing the what the while loop needs to stop. So that's what I would look for. I would look for the fact that somewhere you're not incrementing something. Um, okay. Oh, you put it in the GitLab. Um, okay. So that's the GitLab. Yeah, I don't have a GitLab login, so I'm not going to do that right now. Okay. Um, so does anybody else have any questions? Okay. I'm going to call it. I will. No problem, Michael. I'm going to call this. I will have... Um, it up sometime tomorrow, so check the YouTube channel or hopefully your professors will be sending out a, an announcement. Everybody have a good night and no problem, I'll talk to you later guys. I'm going to end the call now.